Welcome to Not Going Quietly, the podcast where we inspire growth, beat down biases and get into all sorts of good trouble with co-hosts Jonathan Beale and Britt East. No topic is off limits as we explore ways to help everyone leap into life with a greater sense of clarity, passion, purpose and joy. So get ready to join us for some courageous conversation because Not Going Quietly starts right now. Welcome to Not Going Quietly, the podcast for outraged optimists and heartbroken healers all over the world, where we surface life searing truths in the name of radical togetherness. I'm your host, Britt East, and I'm here with a fantastic featured guest. I can't wait for you to meet him. So let's dive right in. Nicholas Blair has worked internationally as a photographer and cinematographer for organizations including CARE, the United Nations, HBO, and PBS television. His filmmaking projects include the documentary America's Culture of Crash about the rural American sport of demolition derby and Our Holocaust Vacation, a journey through Poland with his mother and family revisiting her Holocaust experiences there. He has received fellowships from the National Endowment for the Arts, New York Foundation for the Arts, and Jerome Foundation. His photographs are in the collections of the Metropolitan Museum of Art, International Center of Photography, Brooklyn Museum, and Bibliothèque Nationale in Paris. Nick, how, how, how are you today? Welcome to the show. Thank you so much, Britt. I'm doing fine. Thank you for having me. Yeah, it's so great. I, I had the great fortune to um, see you present at Elliott Bay Book Company out here in Seattle when you were touring your latest photography book, and I was just blown away. I think your book is so beautiful that I knew I wanted to share it with as many people as, as I can. Um, so let's talk some about it. Your, your latest book is called Castro to Christopher, Gay Streets of America, 1979 through 1986. And, you know, coming up, those in our audience watching the video version of this episode We'll get to see some sample images from the book today as we discuss them a little later on. And for those of you on the audio portion, we'll walk you through that as well so you won't feel left out. And you can you can watch them on his website um, on your own time. And of course, we want to include Nicholas's website in the show notes so the rest of you can purchase the book, preview some images, see some of his other work, etc. And like I was saying, I've been totally captivated by your work. How would you describe this book to the audience? Well, I am trying to present a walk through a place in time through my photographic sensibility. So I'm using photography as a nonverbal medium. Um, and it's not that easy. I mean, not all of my work is specific to one place. And uh, as a traditional, quote unquote, street photographer, I'm interested in walking around and just observing and seeing what's going on in in some sense it's it's a c continuation of my first passion which was traveling so you know when you travel and you go to a new place and you're just all eyes and you just want to see as much as possible and you're just totally absorbed and you don't have to think about what you have to do at home like walk your dog and you're just going around well in my first trip which was an extended walkabout through latin america i didn't have a camera but uh, once i got a hold of a camera and started photographing it's a similar sensibility. You walk around, you see something that's interesting. It's a way of saying yes to something that you see. And it's sort of a combination of a found object, carving a rough gemstone and serendipity. Because when you're not in control of what's going on, you're, you're faced with what you see and trying to capture it in, in a certain way that becomes more interesting, I would have to say, than the actual subject itself. So way back when I heard Gary Winogrand, who was, you know, a very, very well known photographer of uh, the last century and has shaped uh, photography in a lot of ways. And, and he, I thought he was a little bit flippant when people asked him, well, why do you take photographs? And he said, well, to see what something looks like as a photograph. And that seemed like, you know, well, what are you really saying? But in actuality, when you think about it, if he wasn't a sort of flippant New Yorker, and I will try not to be that, um, it really is a question of seeing how things look as photographs. And they translate uh, from a three-dimensional reality into a two-dimensional image. And in that image, some things are included, other things aren't. You're freezing a moment in time, which um, elaborates, you can then look at 
Uh, it could be a subtle gesture that is just fleeting for a quarter of a second, but yet it's captured and therefore becomes iconic in a certain way. So um, you see people doing that with their cell phones or, they, or they're taking pictures with their camera all the time. They just want to look at it. How did it look like? Even though we've seen so many pictures, there's still a mystery. And that is the magic of photography of how things translate and how certain images can become very good, even though they're very simple subject matter and other images, which can be very beautiful, like a sunset. My God, one more sunset image. Do we really have to look at that? Right. And also, you know, my criteria a little bit is you have to live up to exceed the expectation of what's in front of you. So if it's just, is it better than the sunset? Well, you know, maybe if you're Ansel Adams and you're doing nature, you can do that, but generally speaking, it's not. So um, that is sort of how my, you know, uh, my philosophy of photography is. And so when I started photographing in uh, Castro Street, um, it was really began sort of earnestly after the murder of Harvey Milk and Mayor Moscone, because at that time I was living in a hippie commune, maybe one of the last ones in San Francisco. We were, we were diehards, but we also had an art gallery and it was a great place just to be able to get into art. And, and we were all involved in art in one way or another. And in the fall of 1978, you know, tragically Harvey Milk and Mayor Moscone were, were murdered. And this was, this was a wake up call. Uh, we had a certain amount of intersectionality between the gay community and our commune um, in other ways that, you know, I possibly tell you about, but even as long haired hippies had dressed, you know, whatever we could be wearing sarongs or anything in the street, we still felt that, or I felt San Francisco was like a free place and an open and accepting place. And I'd been to other places that weren't like that. So when, you know, the murders took place, it was very, very shocking to all of us. And a wake up call um, that there were actually some, you know, very nefarious undercurrents uh, and conservative parts of the city as well. But it was shortly after that, that I started to go down to cover um, and photograph at some of the protests that were going on. I had done some other photographing before at, um, you know, at some other events in, in the gay neighborhoods, not specifically going to those neighborhoods to photograph. But once I got involved and started taking pictures at these events, I really liked what I was seeing and experiencing. It was just a very, very celebratory as well as it was a movement. It was, it was a, a political social movement that was happening in front of me. And by the time I got there, um, which was, um, it was probably early 1979 and started photographing, there already seemed to be some sort of a detente between the police. I don't really know what was going on, but nobody was, there was no head bashing or anything like that. They were standing around. Um, and so there was a very celebratory atmosphere. People were will, really able to be themselves. And the more time I spent in the Castro, the more interesting it became. You just didn't know what would be, what could happen. All of a sudden walking down the street could be three drag queens, or there could be a couple little old ladies in the neighborhood passing those three drag queens and reacting to them. Um, it was just a very, very interesting tableau as compared to, you know, just a regular neighborhood, uh, residential neighborhoods in particular, it can be very, very uh, slow areas to photograph, you're waiting around, somebody walks their dog. But here, all of a sudden, maybe somebody's walking their dog and it could be, you know, a little chihuahua dressed in uh, a leather outfit with a little leather motorcycle hat. So so there was, there was really a lot going on and I just felt myself drawn more and more to, you know, spend time there and photograph. Um, Around that time, or a little while after, about 1980, my brother, who'd been living in Brazil, because part of the nature of our, our commune and collective was that we were also interested in, in um, traveling. And so I had gone to India the year before for about nine months to photograph and, and wander uh, back through Europe. And he was sort of decided he was going to go to South America. So he, he actually went for a couple of years. And when he returned, he was very interested in uh, indigenous culture and specifically Tobias Schneebaum, who was an anthropologist, a gay anthropologist who lived in the Amazon 
uh, with some uh, gay tribes and also in the Sepik River of New Guinea. And he wrote a long article about him. I think um, uh, Shinebaum actually lived uh, right near Christopher Street. And my brother, because we're originally from New York, when he came back to the to the city, he went to visit him and uh, he interviewed him. And uh, he, by the way, he, he great book, Keep the River on Your Right. It's just a great read that, that yeah, he wrote that. about his time living. Have, have you seen that book? It's, it's yeah. very, it's wonderful. So my brother was, you know, shopping this article around and the advocate became interested in it, which is, of course, the national uh, gay magazine. And he was looking at some of my photographs and saw what I was doing. He said, why don't you send some in? Maybe, maybe they'll be interested. And, you know, we were all sort of starving artist types and the idea of getting, um, you know, some work published, of course, was fantastically uh, interesting to me. So I sent some pictures in and, and sure enough, um, they published some. And um, then I also got connected to, uh, I think he was also had some other articles that he had done about the gay uh, scene in Nicaragua, actually on his way um, going in, through South America. And he was also publishing in Gay Hebdo Pie, which was a mm. French uh, monthly magazine. And they were also interested in the work. So that was very encouraging. So I went into the gay area reporter which was a local uh, gay magazine weekly, a little bit like the Village Voice was in New York. And I just walked in a small office and I just showed them a stack of um, five by seven photographs. And I said, will you be interested in any of these? And the editor looked through them very carefully and said, yes, we, we would like to do a, a, a weekly photograph, um, a photography column. What do you want to call it? And so I thought, how about Castro to Christopher Street? And at that time, I had already been photographing a little bit um, on Christopher Street in New York because I was coming home. My family was living in New York and I was from New York. And so, of course, naturally, I would come to New York City uh, and I would I would spend time down there as well. So that really was, you know, lit a little bit more of a, a fire under me in terms of, well, now I have a readership. I, I really have to cover this, you know, properly. I, you know, made trips to uh, Provincetown and uh, also out to, you know, Fire Island. And, you know, of course I was interested in, the, you know, the events that would happen in, in the gay community, like, you know, Pride or Halloween, these were big events, but just everyday life as well. So I actually happen to have a copy of, uh, th this is an advocate um, I was in two of their issues and it's, I'm showing it to you. And I know some of your readers are not going to be able to see this, but it, it was, it's so wonderful when there really were wow. magazines in this world. Uh, it, it was just a, so sad that there are so much, few of them because this is from 1984. And wow. you can see here, here's a, here's a, it's just a spread of about seven of my images from different uh, scenes on uh, Castro Street and from yeah. uh, Christopher Street as well. And it was interesting because in this, I think this was the second uh, edition that I was in, but it, they, they interviewed me a little bit and it says um, that I was interested in, in making a book. So this is 1984. And uh, of course, this is the book didn't come out till 2023. So that's, yeah. that's a little gap of time. <laughs> um, and, I wanted to call it tentatively, it was going to be called the gay eighties. Mm. So I'm glad I stuck with my original, uh, my original title. Um, <laughs> but, um, it was in my mind at, at that point, you know, to do something with these wow. images. And I've always wanted to do a, a book of photographs because, um, photography is so suited to be published because it's such a close rendition to what a print really looks like. Mm. And uh, you can put, you know, an entire collection, in this case, there are 128 images that are all in this one volume. So um, so that's how the project got started. And uh, just very interesting, actually, also to look through this old Advocate magazine, because there's some things that I noticed in here that they wrote about, which was there was a case before the Supreme Court, whether or not gay men would be allowed to cruise and cruising oh. was illegal in like half the states there were of course other you know sodomy laws and all kinds of stuff and it's just unbelievable that 
1984, that was coming before the Supreme Court. Wow. I had not heard that. I'm now I'm a student of gay history and I that's a new one on me. So I'm I'm interested to go read more about that. That's a I, I had not heard that. So for the uh, the people listening on audio, he's holding up a, a copy of The Advocate from 1984, which is just an amazing artifact. And he was previously showing some of, like he was saying, a photo spread. And it's just absolutely incredible. What a gift. Um, Nick, would you um, toggle over to sharing some of your images and, um, and sharing your screen? And while he gets that going, uh, listeners, I'll kind of um, set it up for you. So um, like I referenced previously, Nick has a photography website out there. It's nicholasblairphotography.com. And we'll put that in the show notes so you don't have to scramble and, and jot it down. It'll it'll be easily um, read. And as part of that website, he has um, teaser images of his um, photography books and um, and some of the photos inside, um, just, you know, just several of them. And so we're going to walk you through some today. It's something we've never really done on this show before. So I'm really excited about it because, you know, a picture says a thousand words, as they always say. And so it's like, let's get straight to it rather than just theorize about photography. Let's actually look at some of the images. So you should be able to see if you're watching this on YouTube, you should be able to see the actual images. And Nick is going to walk us through them, what you're seeing. He's going to describe them for you. Uh, the the, the folks who are on audio only. He's going to describe them for you so you guys can enjoy this as well. And he'll talk about some of his motivation, some of the composition, what's going on there, et cetera. So Nick, take it away. Well, thank you. Um, this first image is, was taken at a pride uh, celebration in San Francisco, and it depicts uh, a, an older man well-dressed in a hat who people have commented looks a lot like William Burroughs, the <laughs> poet. And he has his hands crossed and uh, he's wearing a tie and a jacket and uh, uh, looks very proper. And right next to him, a little bit closer to the camera, are two men that look like they're almost statues in embrace. They're looking into each other's eyes um, very lovingly and their arms are entwined around each other. And the question, um, well, first of all, there's not no one's looking at the parade, which is ostensibly in the background. Um, and so the two men are focused on each other. And what I like about the picture is the ambiguity mm. and the question of what this older guy is doing there. Did he just, um, as uh, Jim Farber, who wrote the introduction, has described some people just got off the bus at the wrong stop? Or did he make an effort to go down to the pride? Uh, parade and and be um, be a witness. Mm. So it's it's one of the things that I like about <clears throat> photographs to be very, they're very specific about what they're about on one hand, but on the other hand, they don't really tell you what's going on and uh, leaves a lot to interpretation. Um, the next picture is um, at an Insta bank. A couple of uh, leather boys are getting money out of the bank and it's a very kind of normal thing to do actually at that time i think instabank had only been out or cash machines were a very new thing uh and there they are just doing their regular business but they're wearing leather chaps and leather vests and and have tattoos and and leather hats and so this is just the kind of thing that you might see in the castro walking around and next to them is a person, uh, another fellow with his back turned, and um, he's also getting money. So it just it's just sort of a normal thing, but something you wouldn't normally see in other parts of the town. <laughs> Fantastic. This, uh, this next picture has a, a woman is looking directly into the camera, and she's actually on the corner of Castro and Market Street. And uh, back over one shoulder are two men kissing, and back over the other, another shoulder are two men hugging, and there's another woman behind her, and both the women are looking directly at me. Um, it has uh, sort of soft light coming in from the side. And again, what I like is, uh, it, first of all, it shows what could be happening on a street corner at any particular time, but also the ambiguity of, you know, who are these women? You know, what are they doing? What's really going on here? 
and um, it's just sort of a beautiful tableau. Walking away on the left side is 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 uh, another gentleman with a leather jacket. Um, this uh, next photograph are, is of two women uh, kissing each other um, and fairly close up about a waist shot. They have their arms around each other. It has strong light coming in from the side. It's late afternoon light. This is a very typical time for photographers to go out because things look more interesting at that time. And it's very, uh, it has a very erotic overtone. Um, one woman is actually sucking a little bit on the other woman's lips. Um, one woman looks like she is a woman of color and the other uh, is, is not. Um, this next photograph was taken at Halloween in San Francisco. It shows um, two quite young men uh, locked arm in arm walking down the street. One who's looking, they're both looking directly into the camera. The one in the middle is wearing a necklace and is wearing false tits. And one tit is up and one tit <laughs> is down. And uh, she's also wearing a wig and has uh, quite curly hair and a very soft mustache, but very deep, dark, penetrating eyes. And her partner has a, um, what do you call that kind of mustache? It's not a handlebar, but it's a, it's a straight, uh, it's um, a very big mustache. It kind of wraps down to the chin. And uh, he's just wearing a very thin leather vest and also looking into the camera. Behind them to the side is, is uh, a, a, a man leaning against the, the uh, a storefront and another man on the other side is wearing sort of a, a, a bozo wig and um, some sort of a, um, I don't even know what you call that garment, but it's not a shirt. It, it's sort of a feminine yeah. uh, dress, but, um, and they're just walking down the street. Now, back in those days, there was no Halloween parade and it's just, it's kind of unbelievable how big Halloween has gotten at yeah. this point. I mean, I've been to the last few Halloweens in New York and it's, there's two rows yeah. of police barricades and you can't <laughs> even, you know, cross the street for 20 blocks. And back in, uh, 1982 when this was taken it was just people walking around on castro street and later when i went and photographed uh, other halloweens on christopher street they're just people just walking around and you could go anywhere and photograph and everything seemed a lot more casual now to really get into the scene in new york you need a press pass and yeah. um it's just way more formalized but it also does show how this event has taken over and captivated the American culture. Absolutely. Yeah. Oh, so uh, this is my favorite. This is, is my favorite photograph in the entire book. So I'm really glad you're showing it. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, this is just the kind of thing that you could see on um, Castro Street yeah. or Christopher Street, for that matter. And it's three men with with substantial mustaches in drag, looking looking very beautiful, and just posing for the camera and giving a very um, penetrating gaze. The the um, the lady in the middle, um, and they have very big earrings and also a large uh, the the uh, lady in the foreground. I'm not sure do I call them ladies or do I call them men, um, but they have a very large uh, flower in uh, above the ear and also some sort of chiffon wraparound uh, see-through uh, webbing. And this was why it was such a wonderful uh, place to photograph because this could just come <laughs> around, they could come around a corner, just unusual things could happen. It was, it was much more fun and interesting than sort of a regular uh, residential neighborhood. Um, let's see, the next photograph shows a couple of a uh, woman in, in leather. Um, it looks like, well, one woman is embracing the other woman from behind and has her hands wrapped around her and is putting one hand underneath her 
vest, her leather vest, uh, is, and uh, the woman who is being embraced from behind looks like she actually has her hands down the, the pants of the woman behind her. And she has um, uh, handcuffs and a keychain, and they they look very very stylish um, with uh, sunglasses. And it's it's it, at a um, the Folsom Street Fair, I believe. And there's a, a woman in the background with a skin knee taking a photograph of something we're not sure what, but you do see some of the fair behind them. Um, the next photograph was, was in the West village and it was taken, uh, if not actually at night, close to night, it's, it's pretty, uh, dark. Um, and there are two men in a very beautiful Cadillac car with the door open, just sitting there. Uh, one is, is, um, wearing just a, a t-shirt and the other has a, uh, bigger shirt on, but there is somebody, the, the, the top is down. It's a convertible and there is somebody drinking in bare feet sitting on the windscreen um, above them and looking at the camera. They're, they're all three of them are looking at the camera and behind are a couple of guys standing on some stoops in uh, the West Village. Hmm. Uh, this next photograph has two men kind of side hugging. So you see their fronts and they almost look like butterfly wings that are opened up and they're on the left. And behind them, there are three men that are standing, looking around, wearing their, all three of the men are wearing blue jeans and, um, and t-shirts, um, or actually one has a hoodie and, um, I just maybe right here, I'll, I'll just read what Marvin Hefferman yeah. he wrote a little thing for the back of the book. Yeah. It said, um, call them street photographs if you like, but they're unexpectedly compelling and richly revealing. Made it a crossroads of desire. They're all about everyday erotics and history, the politics of looking and the rewards and consequences of being seen. Mm. So the guys in the background are looking. And they're looking around and even though they're looking for something different than what I was looking for at that point, um, we're all, we're, 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 I was out there looking around and they're looking around and, um, there was a lot of looking around going on. Um, and what I find very amusing of course, is the t-shirt, which says VD, uh, Vici Veni, which is a take on, I, I, um, I came, I came, I, I came, no, I, I saw, I, well, the way it, the way it reads is I, I, I saw, I conquered, I came right. <laughs> instead of, I uh, I came, I, I saw, I conquered. So good. So it's, it's the camp, yeah. you know, there was a certain style of camp that very, very humorous yeah. and, um, then this this next picture is of, of, of a, a black man holding a beer, smoking a cigarette, and he also looks like he's almost out of a, a Marlboro commercial. Yeah. Um, but he's wearing a, a black motorcycle jacket, and um, he's looking in profile. And in the background, you see people that are sort of hanging around an open an open bar, um, and he's a very handsome looking guy. Um, and he looks like he's almost posing, but I don't think he, I think he was always almost posing. <laughs> um, and um, this, the last photograph I have here is of two men in a passionate embrace. Um, they both, one is completely to, uh, topless. The other has his, uh, just a little vest on. Mm -hmm. um, one is holding the other face as he kisses them and the one who's being kissed is actually holding um the other man's nipple uh who seems to have um an erection in his in his pants and i i find it just very passionate and erotic photograph mm. um it has a very strong light and and just the intertwining of their arms around each other um it 
it really um, expresses a, a feeling of the time. And there's overtones of dominance and submission in this one that are pretty strong. Um, yes. Nick, thank yes. you for sharing these images. It's um, so kind of you. Um, these are just a taste of the images in Nick's book. And I encourage everybody to purchase it, check it out. It's absolutely captivating. And like I keep saying, um, you can find where to buy it on nicholasblair.photography.com and we'll give you the link and make it really easy for you. But um, back to the, the work, um, you know, one of the things I was struck by is that, of course, I can't help but think, you know, these are all identified picture by picture with a time and a place. So they're very grounded um, in time and place, um, which is way before the internet. <laughs> When, like you alluded to at the beginning of the show, so much of queer life was centered around cruising and bar hopping and everything happened in real time on the streets as opposed to asynchronously on a smartphone app. Now, Nick, you and I are gentlemen of a certain age, so we don't know how this works, but apparently there are smartphones with apps on them and you use them to avoid meeting in real time. And so the world has just changed dramatically. So there's something really special about this book because it's harkens to a time gone by. There's an immediacy to the experience, which, you know, that means there's an immediacy to the images that you captured. We're not being coddled by our mutual disembodied anonymity. We're not hiding behind these screens. You, you know, maybe we were dancing with one eye on the door, but at least we were dancing. We weren't just swiping. And, you know, I, it's like you had to be there, literally. Like the, the, the guy right, who wrote this beautiful foreword to your book said, that's really struck me. You literally had to be there, whereas now it's like you can be anywhere. And so there's something so powerful in this, and it almost feels like a gift to the queer community. And, um, I, you know, you, you talked about your journey at the beginning, Nick, but I can't help wondering, this is very atypical for us. And I bet I'm not alone in this feeling. I bet a lot of people in the audience don't know a lot of straight guys who would devote time and energy to getting to know our culture um, and present it in a way that is celebratory, empowering, full of wit and wisdom, not putting us on a pedestal, not coming in with an agenda, not trying to speak for us or read our mind, but observing. And I kind of don't understand like how you got here and where, like, you know, you described the zeitgeist of, of the moment and, you know, your literal journey, but it's like, where did this sense of openness come in you as an artist? Was it you know, do, do you do you have queer friends and relatives? Do you like, you know, how, how did you who are you? How did you get here? How did you do this? Well, um, thanks for asking me that. I'm happy to talk about that. I do want to give a shout out just um, to Jim Farber, who did write yeah. an incredible because I am not gay. And and even though I am observing what's happening in the street and um, there is a lot more going on, um, off the street. And Jim can talk about that and does talk about this in just a fantastic introduction that I was just so happy to get. He's such a great writer and he's so honest and open and uh, he lived through the time as well. Um, so that was that was really, really wonderful of him. And um, when we were at the commune, the whole hippie thing, there was a certain intersectionality between the hippie thing and the gay thing. Our general philosophy was you do what you want. You are just, there are no rules. In fact, our commune had no rules, which is probably why the commune only lasted so many years because <laughs> it was a little chaotic. But just to give you a little bit of insight, for example, when I got there, my brother, the way the commune evolved is it, it, was, it, was, it was like a shared, uh, it's not a flat because it, was, it had a storefront it had, um, it actually had a back carriage house that had been fixed up. And so there were a bunch of art students from the San Francisco Art Institute living there. And when I walked in, uh, this was in um, 1975 and it was very early February. And I noticed there was a pumpkin on a shelf in, in this uh, storefront. And it, by that point, it was only a half a pumpkin. And you can imagine it was put up there for Halloween and a few months had gone by and the thing just went oh. souffle yeah. down to a half a pumpkin. And that gives you a sort of a sense 
of what was going on. But a woman who was living there with her, uh, with her girlfriend, um, her name was Strutt. We called her Strutt. Her full name was Nancy Hadeen. She had a um, Camino vehicle, like a um, which was like a little pickup truck on the back. But it's not a pickup truck, but it's it's a Camino. I forget who makes it, but um, I think it's a Ford. And anyway, we would do, go dumpster diving, and and somebody would give the alert, like, "Oh, look in back of Safeway supermarket, there's all this food." come get it or something else. We pick up furniture and she had the one vehicle. Well, she's the one who started the gallery and she lived there with her girlfriend. I don't, whatever. She was just a person living there. I didn't really think much about, uh, you know, her, her sexual orientation. Um, and she decided to create the gallery. One day she wrote ancient currents gallery with motor oil. And we had been slowly cleaning up the storefront. And that was the beginning of Ancient Grunts Gallery. And she hung up a bunch of artwork. And uh, of course, my brother says it took two years of painting to cover that motor oil. <laughs> so there was a certain intersectionality going on there. And I could uh, go a little further and explain that at one point, my brother was making a movie. This was also pretty early on. The movie was called Sammy Delirium. And he... Um, you was using me. I was sort of his muse. And I'd been in other films of his, even when he was in high school, he'd, he'd want me to do this or that. And I'd be like, okay, whatever, you know? So the scene was that I was playing a sort of deranged Coke dealer who was trying to sell Coke to raise money to pay for a film, which ostensibly was not really how it was working. Well, I had some money, he might've finished the film, but I was playing in a scene that I was in a bathtub and he was filming me and I was in sort of a delirium and talking about my travels in South America where I had traveled and about, um, you know, cocaine and this and that. But meanwhile, it was my birthday and out in the gallery, there was going to be a birthday party for me all in real time. And so when I heard um, the, Sammy, which was my stage name, Sammy Delirium, the candles are melting on your cake. I was to get out of the bathtub, stark naked and walk out into the gallery where there are about you know, 15 or 20 people that my brother had put together for this particular scene. So being a dutiful younger brother, I and and taking my acting job seriously, I got out of the bathtub, completely dripping wet, walked out into the um, into the gallery storefront and and everyone sang happy birthday. And at that point, I noticed that my brother had also had two very, very attractive drag queens that he had brought in. I, I don't really know where he met them or how he cast his his scene, but one of them was named Dawn and uh, she was a blonde. And they were both they were both very attractive. And um, after the little happy birthday, she came over to me and whispered in my ear, can I go down on you? And um, I was, you know, I'm the scene. So I'm like, you know, whatever you want to do, you know, go for it. So we had a little scene there. Not a whole lot happened with 20 people standing around. But subsequently, my brother showed he did an edit. and He showed the movie in New York. And to my chagrin, my parents were invited to see this. Oh, no. So the scene, <laughs> the scene comes out and I can't even look at it. And I don't even know what my mother is doing. But it was that was the most embarrassing part of it. But this was it just gives you a flavor of yeah. what was going on and, and anybody could really do anything. Um, I mean, in fact, also, you know, a very, very, very close friend of mine, Larry Bear, who took me under his wing and taught me a lot about photography when I first got there. And he was a close friend of my brother's and he had studied with Gary Winogrand, who I mentioned before, a very important street photographer and photographer in 20th century. He was, in fact, I, I didn't really know know his sexual orientation um, until, you know, later he, he did, he did have AIDS. He came down with AIDS and unfortunately, very sadly died in, in 1990. But, you know, we would not necessarily be photographing in the gay areas together, but we could be photographing in the gay areas together. We would just go out photographing. That's just what we did. We just hung out and we, we cruised all over, um, you know, California. I mean, we went down to LA, we went to Santa Cruz, and then he eventually got, you uh, he got a fellowship. It was part of the Guggenheim, I think. Um, and then he was in New York and I would be back in New York. And I remember we just going out on the pier in, in New York City, um, which had a much different vibe, I have to say, than San Francisco. 
Um, but this beautiful, beautiful pier, which they unfortunately have, yeah. um, have completely yeah. gentrified. Um, but the light was so fantastic at the end of the day. And it wasn't just a gay thing out there, although it was yeah. very much a gay thing out there. But, but pe other, you know, people would just, it was just a great place. I mean, as a photographer, you look for great light. Um, you look for things that, that are going on. And, and, and Larry and I were out there many, many times. So there just was a lot of intersectionality between um, the hippie thing and the gay thing. And it was just like, you know, we, we, there's just no judgment. It's just whatever, yeah. whatever um, people want to do. And I just recognized it sort of intuitively that this was some sort of social political movement. And I, I mean, partially I had traveled at that point already, I'd probably traveled to about 25 countries um, and I'd never seen anything like it. And it yeah. was just, it was just a very interesting place to be and a very happening place to be. And you, you captured this moment was bookended by um, gay liberation on one end and the dawn of AIDS on the other. So it's this really special time that you've memorialized. And I couldn't help thinking when I, uh, you know, when I was first going through the book, what would you like straight audiences to understand about the people that you photographed? Well, I don't know if I could really put it it, just we're all human beings, you know, we're just all human beings. And this is what was so attractive about the scene then is people just being people, loving them, each other, just being who they want to be and just being free uh, instead of what you might say is sort of stuck up or, you know, so it was just it was just coming out out of out of um, out of their shell, um, you know, my and so I can't really put anything in, in a specific word like I want people to get this or to get that. But, um, you know, for me, photographing is a sign of respect. It's it's a sign of um, saying yes to something. Um, it's it's um, I mean, I, I have to, you know, be honest, even though I was just looking and I saw that, oh, in 1984, I was wanting to make a book, you know, which seemed, you know, very, um, you know, ambitious of me. But I, I did like I've made I've made documentaries um, in film, and with a documentary in film, you really think about exactly what you're asking me is what are you trying to convey? It's not necessarily you don't necessarily go out with one idea in mind. You you might develop the idea as as things um, you know as things you know evolve in your research of doing the documentary. But you try to say, well, we want to show what a place looks like. We want to. You know, we'll talk to some people, we'll interview some people, we'll give a big picture and a small picture and, and try and think about it intellectually. I was really working much more intuitively, I think, mm -hmm. and just being drawn to what was going on. But as I mentioned, eventually, once I was being published, excuse me, then thinking, oh, well, I haven't been to Provincetown, you know, I, 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 I want to go to Provincetown and I'm just going to, you know, go up there and spend a few days and just check out the scene or or go out to Fire Island and, and just see what's going on out there. So, so I it did make me a little more conscious of trying to to uh, you know cover uh, other areas, but I didn't think about it in the same way as doing a, a documentary. So, it became very challenging to put together a book mm. and and how to show the different facets of what was going on um, and how to work with with just with images rather than as you say you know what do you what am i trying to say i'm i'm, I'm really trying to say that this is this is what was going on you know yeah. this is what it looked like how and, did you um how, how did you choose the images how did you know when to stop i'm sure you had many more images than there were even in the book well that's absolutely true i'm very very lucky that i i had uh two close friends one gary halpern who was the editor of uh, photo uh, media magazine in Seattle and who, who you, um, I, he was, he was there at the Elliott yeah. Bay, um, yeah. that, that night. And, and he published photo media, um, for, I think about 15 or 20 years. And, uh, so he's very good at sequencing and he's a really, really a stickler and you need people that can look at your work and just say, no, this is <laughs> because most, most, 
you know, artists or writers or, right. or photographers, you, you, you're kind of in love with a lot. They're all your babies, right. you know? And, um, and you so don't know what I went through very, to get this hard. image. <laughs> exactly. And you see one, you say, wow, this is it. This is so great. And just, they're like, uh, no, but on the other <laughs> hand, somebody they're like, yes, it, yeah, yeah. it is really good. Yeah. And so, and he's also, it's very difficult to sequence photographs. If you just have one on a page, it's just like, it can, the sequencing is much easier. You can follow it with just another mm. one and, 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 uh, it has to relate in some ways, but when they're facing each other, they have to relate on many levels. They don't mm. necessarily have to look the same. They can look the same, but they just have to relate and work. And they, you, you don't want the eye to have to fight or work hard to, to take it in. So uh, in addition to Gary, I had another friend who, who looked at an edit. He, Gary was really in there from the beginning. And I have to say that if he was getting a, a dollar for every hour, he'd be, that he helped me on this, he'd be a rich man. But um, eventually, uh, another friend of mine came to New York. He, he now lives in Hungary, and um, and I showed it to him. He'd also been involved. Well, we had done documentaries together, uh, more commercial stuff. And uh, he looked at it, and he was like, no. you." And he really had something and wrong opinions. And and he was right, because the way the book was structured at that point, was it was not there. So the beauty of having two people is that I knew if I floated an idea, if they both said no, okay, just forget <laughs> it. If one said yes and one said no, then I could pretty much decide what I want to do. Yeah, break the time. And if they both said yes, then I knew I was I really yeah. had something going yeah. for me. Yeah. And it I really couldn't have done it without them. It was just so important to get another objective viewer. I also had other friends that I would occasionally say, take a look at this. What do you think? Um, I mean, people in the gay community as well, because I did want, I did want their take uh, on it. And um, but, you know, people you can't. I mean, poor Gary, he probably looked at like 50 or 60 renditions of the book and most, you know, friends, okay, one or two, it's sort of like, you know, talking about your breakup or something. They're like, okay, it's uh, whatever. I saw that image, you know, they don't, they, they, they don't have the, the time or capacity. Um, Cause of course I do know quite a few photographers. Um, so it, it took a, about um, three or four renditions. I even, um, you can have books published very inexpensively. Now I even had one published through Lightroom, you can send it to Blurb, and I just yeah. okay, let's see what it looks like as as a as a as a book. So um, you know, hundred bucks here it is. I say, wow, okay, that's interesting because it's different when it's online than mm -hmm. when it's an actual physical yeah, book. It's fascinating. And then I actually made a mock up of actual real prints that are in its. It's called a post binder, and it's it it ends up being about three inches thick and has like a metal cover and you can really sequence them that way as well and, mm. and just get a feeling for the physical flow of the book. Sometimes people flip the book from right, you know, from back to yeah, front. Yeah. It's like a natural thing. I don't know why I do it too, but it's so you could, you, you have to think of it front to back, back to front. And then yeah. ultimately I came up with this idea of, um, of the chapters just to break it up a little and using some gray pages and then images that are a few images that are a little bigger. So you don't want it to be too, um, too much like the same. You're just looking at the same space at the same size image on a page one after yeah. another. So it, it took yeah. a it took a long time. And, yeah, that's amazing. Uh, and I did feel like I wanted to flush out the different, the different aspects of, of the, mm -hmm. you know, what was going on within the framework of that culture. You know, I'm going to make you cringe a little bit by giving you some of my opinions for the sake of the, the audience here. Um, what I take away from the book that I think is so special is that you have somehow managed to capture this moment of public liberation where these beautiful, I'll call them children, they're adults, but I almost mean like as a community um, in, on the maturation curve, like um, where they had been um, cloistered and empowered secretly for generations, now through all sorts of fighting and, and changing of laws and protests and marches, now we're able to take up public space 
in many cases for the first time and be all of themselves with each other. And so there's a sense of camaraderie, there's a sense of audacity, there's a sense of fun and humor and irony and camp. Um, and <laughs> I'm trying not to cry. Um, it's so special because you know it's coming. And you, when you, when you look at the images, you can't help but wonder how their lives might change over the intervening year or decades. And you, you can't help but wonder what some of them might have gone through. And yet you captured their radiance for all time. And so it's like, it's still alive. And um, it's a beautiful gift to the queer community. And it, it's uh, these absolutely breathtaking images. And I sincerely hope that everybody checks out your work who's listening. And, um, you know, you've done a lot more other work than this book, like you alluded to. And um, I, I really hope that um, people take the time to, to get to know you as an artist. And um, like I said, we'll give them a, a way to um, uh, a link where they can buy the book really easily and, and see more of your work. Um, but it's just been such an absolute pleasure to get to know you a little bit. To I got the chance to meet you in person briefly in, at Elliott Bay Bookstore, a wonderful independent bookstore in Seattle. And I'm so grateful that you took the time to not only invest in the collection of these images, but the preservation of them, the curation of them, and now the publishing of them. That is no small feat. And you did a really great job outlining the love and care that, that goes into that. That is, that is a tremendous amount of work. And um, I'm just, I just am so moved by it. And, and I'm really glad that you uh, came on this show today to, to introduce yourself to our audiences and, and allow them to get to know your work a little bit better. Britt, thank you. Thank you so much. You're making me tear up as well. <laughs> and, um, it's, it was a very dark time that it all ended on and that can't be overlooked, but there was this little window. Yeah. Um, and you know, I, I just want to thank the queer community for being out there and, and the way it's, Influence. I mean, for example, now there are drag shows like all over the country, you know, yeah, and the crazy. Halloween parade is this big thing. So it, um, I, re you know, at one point I thought of the title American Queer because I just feel that it was like, this is America, you know, and, uh, you know, fuck you, Anita Bryant. And, yeah, and yeah. it felt like it was more specific to, to certain areas and certain you know, streets per se. So I didn't go with that, but I just think, um, you know, the overall influence is, um, it's just undeniable how, you know, creative the queer community is and, um, what a fantastic part of our culture to celebrate. Yeah. And there's an urgency to it as well. Like when, as a viewer, like I project myself subconsciously in these images and you almost place yourself in the scene in lieu of the photographer and there's an urgency to it when you consider today's contemporary political realities we don't know what's on the horizon it feels as if we're on a knife's edge i'm not uh, alluding to another virus but that could be the case or it could be a political reality everybody at least in the U.S. right now, I get letters from people all over in the world. You know, what's it like to live in the U.S.? It feels like we're on a knife's edge every day in the U.S. right now. And there's something about your book that ca that reflects that immediacy, that urgency to it, so that that you're laughing, you're crying, you feel empowered, you feel a wide range of emotions as you're viewing the images, and it's just a it's so compelling, absolute triumph and. It's been an absolute pleasure to talk with you today. And, and thank you so much from the bottom of my heart. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Yeah. Okay, listeners, you have done it. You've made it. Yeah, go ahead. Do I, I just, Rahal X, um, 
sorry if you're hearing these crazy beats, but he, he was also lived in the commune for, for yeah. a year or more. Um, and he, he was actually writing something for the book. Unfortunately, he, he, he is also passed, but he, he, this is one thing that he wrote that, yeah. um, that, and he has a little quote on the book too, but the time of LGBTQ activism are not at all over au contraire. Today, more than ever, it becomes clear that what we have gained in terms of equality and human wow. rights can also easily be lost again. It is like maintaining a precious garden an ongoing project and it needs love light and plenty of water otherwise bad weed the retrograde folks and hater buddies could take over and destroy the achievement we fought for and that is a global problem just like flighting, fighting climate change and mm -hmm. and he wrote that uh, probably in in uh, in 2019 um and then unfortunately he he, he got sick and was um, um, unable to really write more but I just um thank you for that it's really beautiful i really appreciate that what an amazing epilogue well listeners you've done it you've made it through another hour of not going quietly we cannot do the show without you thank you so much from for all of your support thanks to our guest nicholas blair like i said we'll give you his links in the show notes so you can find him all over the place really easily um, we're a podcast for outraged optimists and heartbroken healers all over the world. This podcast is for you. It would not exist without your support. Thank you so much. It means the world to me. Until next time. Bye-bye. You've been listening to Not Going Quietly with co-hosts Jonathan Beal and Britt East. Thanks so much for joining us on this wild ride as we explore ways to help everyone leap into life with a greater sense of clarity, passion, purpose, and joy. Check out our show notes for links, additional information, and episodes located on your favorite podcast platforms.